Good day, everyone. We are going to discuss for this day strategic management philosophies. The course is managerial accounting, or this is management advisory services. So similar to those two terms. Now you can see on the screen different terms related with the word strategy or strategic. If we say strategy, that's going to be the set of actions, courses of actions or solutions intended to answer or respond or focus with the long-term perspective. So more than one year and more, of course. So it could be five years to 10 years, etc. That's what strategy is all about. Now, in this chapter, we are going to look into the philosophies that we will have or these are our perspectives and the concepts or the guidance that we will have in strategic management. Now, our source is the book of Agamata, so we will be dividing this into two parts because this is going to be a lengthy discussion anyway. So we have here the objectives of strategic management philosophies. So we are going to discuss them in detail as we go along the way. All right. So first stop would be for this one here is that we are going to look into some techniques about strategic management philosophies and techniques which are tabulated take note these are just some this particular table is not like the list overall now allow me to go back first to these objectives so these objectives will be the guidance that we will have at the end of the chapter that we can, or you as learners can differentiate traditional management from strategic management models. For example, that's the first objective. Or discuss the importance of quality processes. So you as learners can do such, or these following objectives. All right? And then, Let's continue. So here are our management philosophies and techniques, strategic in nature or long-term. Then basically they are divided into philosophy and technique, right? So as here as being tabulated, here are the techniques and here are the relevant management concepts and practices. Then below or at the bottom of the philosophy, we have the major philosophies, TQM or Total Quality Management, ABM or Activity-Based Management, JIT, Just-in-Time, and etc. And we have here the techniques also. So how do we differentiate then philosophies from techniques? That could be, or that could be a question. Philosophy means the concept. Philosophy means the guidance, right? The philosophy means the theoretical background or framework of a certain technique. Well, the technique now is the action, or that would be our specific courses of action about the philosophy, right? It's like science and technology. Science is the concept, technology is the application of the science. So philosophy means the knowledge, while well, technique is the application of that knowledge. All right. So that's why the technique here is activity-based costing because we are now going to compute how much the costs are depending on the activity or the drivers or the activity drivers. That's going to be discussed in detail anyhow as we go along the way. So that's just one example. And then the technique is... For example, the life cycle costing, it can be a technique, of course, but it can also be a philosophy as said. Or the point of this one, if you can notice, life cycle costing has check marks, for example, under philosophy and techniques. It's because, I said a while ago, it can be, it's because the costing is a technique as here, as being shown here. However, it will touch still the philosophy. That's the point. So meaning there's a philosophy also talking about life cycle costing. All right. Then also among other things being to continue after these summaries. Oh my, there are so many of them. And here are 
our abbreviations. So we will be discussing them in detail as we go along the way. All right, modern business environment, of course, is the result of a lot of changes and disruptions and dynamism in our environment, especially in business. So there are changes in technology, changes of the laws. We can use the PESO analysis of political, economic, social, technological, environmental, and legal factors that influence what the business environment is in the modern time. So there are a lot of developments that happened along the way, and that's why the business environment has become modern. So characteristics would be technology, could be the employees are skillful now, they're multi-skilled, then products are made on global standards. Since we are not any more limited by producing our products to our citizens in the country, so our co-Filipinos, for example, but we also expand to a lot of people in the world. So that's why the products are manufactured based on global standards. Customers becoming intelligent, that's the truth. Customer is the king, as they say, so they demand what is to be provided by a company, whether good or service. So that's why there is a really a very big change in the business environment landscape. All right. Aside from management focusing on speed and accuracy, there's also a shift towards from the short-term profitability to strategic sustainability. So profitability will just be short-term, but it will build the company's sustainability. However, that's not just the end of it. When you make a business, profitability is not just the end of that particular case. It's going to extend along the way and in order for the organization to continue in an indefinite period of time, and that's business. So the organizational systems will be part of the ecosystem, so the industry and the economy as a whole. Then quality is what the customer says. So if a customer, for example, would demand and would say that these are the qualities that I am or we are looking for about or they are looking for about a certain product, then they would be able to dictate the products produced by the company. Of course, because they are the ones to buy the products and services, the goods and services rather of the company because products can be goods and services, right? Goods, tangible, services, intangible, but they can be used interchangeably anyway, like products, as goods, etc. So going back, as emphasized that satisfying customer needs or customer's needs means finding what the customer wants. So what really are they aspiring for? What do they want to get about a certain product? And that's what going to dictate about the quality that the company must provide. Otherwise, no one or nobody will be buying the products produced by the company. So customer is the king. All right, so quality is what customer says. The customer says power, the seller says durability, fashionability, safe, etc. Comfort, price. So if we can notice, there has been a lot of differences about the perspectives of the customer and the seller. In such case, the customer's need would not be satisfied in the event that the two does not coincide with each other. Therefore, the seller has to adjust to the needs of the customer. So listening is very important to the part of the seller to satisfy the needs and wants of the customers. Also, in today's world, complaints are very important. Comments are very important in developing or improving the operations of the business. 
as said or as explained that complaints are opportunities for improvement or OFIs. So that's why they are there. Then quality is the total of features and characteristics of a product made or a service performed. So it's the overall aspect of the thing, including aesthetics, reliability, serviceability, fitness for use, perceived quality, and conformance. So everything that has to do with the product or good or service can, of course, help the quality that the customer wants. All right, after that is the paradigm shift. So in this particular case, the customer now has the power, of course, or the buyer to influence the decision-making that the seller company has to provide. All right, so that's why the corporate boards, executive offices, Everyone in the company operating departments so from top to bottom should also adjust to the profound changes in the business environment. So as said, this could be business relationships, psychology of employees, handling of activities, application of methods, and the emergence of new or recent management terms. So in other words, there are so many changes happening in the environment that the company is facing, not just internal but the more on the external because it's so big the macro exosystem is very big for the company so here are some i mean differences so or references that's what i wanted to say so the point of reference would be you have here for traditional management independent companies and strategic management interdependent companies so meaning to say in terms of the relationships among the businesses, there already are from being alone, standalone company to connected companies. So they need each other in the process. A company needs the suppliers to provide for the raw materials needed for the products, and they need also their customers so that they can have profits and continue to become sustainable. So those things. Next, employees. Employees are individualistic or listic rather, or individualism is emphasized. Then in strategic management, we also have here integration. So we can just say that for the first and second, traditional management is really closely connected. Independent companies, individualism. So standalone but on the strategic integration so the company's processes are being connected with another so that one is integrated to such then creative innovative innovations adjustments to the changes in the business landscape are taken into account or consideration so the responsibility is taken Endeavors are initiated towards self-education and improvement. Then empowered, multi-skilled, participatory. So meaning there's collaboration in aspects in terms of the employees. Then I like this one, demands for ownership. So they want improvement of the process equity. They want to be safe in terms of their work. Then labor costs has become fixed and has diminished in total. Yeah, that's true unless there would be some increases in salary and it's now part of factory overhead or is integrated in the conversion cost. I thought that's true. Factory overhead now, especially in today's world, strategic management probably would focus more on the machines, right? So the machines costs are very costly, but the labor cost, like support now of the machines would be part of the factory overhead. So you can just imagine the movement from the traditional to strategic. Then, is integrated in the conversion cost account? Of course, conversion cost is direct labor plus factory overhead. Activities, you have here traditional input, output, and product-oriented, but in strategic management is output to input the reverse, in other words, and 
very process oriented. Okay, in terms of methods, here inspection is done at the end, but here is made before the process or meaning all throughout. So it's not enough that inspection is done like just one time at the end because if there are errors to be made or committed, then 100% of the cost of the errors will be carried forward at the end also. So that's why the inspection is done all throughout. That's total quality management. Then there are so many things being said here, but we'll just pick organizational structure is hierarchical and functional, but here it's lean and mean organizational system and system based. So traditional would be focused more on the organizational charts, but the latter strategic would be aside from the hierarchical, there would be like sort of another format or form of the organizational system that's going to make it then production is labor intensive it's more on manpower but for strategic it's technology oriented so it's more on using the machines the modern equipment and technologies available all right so these are just some of the highlights company customer and then this one is more on integrated supplier company customer so this is called integrated approach, or this is the concept of the so-called supply chain management, right? That's supply chain management. In terms of capital expenditures, that's less investment, but it's heavy in capital, especially for machines. Machines will really cost millions and billions of pesos, for example. In terms of cost in the short run, that's going to be less. And the strategic it's going to be, the target is that even in the long run, it's going to be lower. So not just the short term. Okay, here are the managerial terms. So these terms are very, I would say, long, long time ago. So outdated terms. But this one, these are the terms that we are seeing nowadays. Like Kaizen, continuous improvements, and so on. All right. Principles of modern management would we'll talk about change, technology, and quality. So, as said, this is like what has been aptly put by a Renaissance philosopher. So, there has been or there are only three permanent things in this world, and these are death, taxes, and change. So, in fact, change is here to stay. So, as also said by others like the improvement of this one is that there are only three permanent things in this world change change and change so change is here to stay change is the genesis of quality environment meaning it's the start so whenever there is change it would exacerbate the processes of the businesses existing or still to implement it would also change the perspectives of the people composing on the organization from top to bottom. Change also would enable the people to look out of themselves, to think outside of the box, so that they would be able to go with the pace of the ever-changing business environment. So it in other words, would necessitate also the change within, not just because changed outside factors, they have been there already, then the changes within the organization would not be done. No, otherwise the change would be useless and the business would die out of its environment and the competition there that there was. So that's why change has to be considered. And change is very important. This would really test and make or break a business. There is change because a need is not yet satisfied. That's true. So we have to continuously update our products, our processes 
because the needs also of our customers are changing, ever changing. There are changes because perhaps there has been a need that is unsatisfied or there are changes already in the environment. And then I love the word disruptive, turbulent and disruptive changes and awesome technological advances. Customer satisfaction is more than ever the prime business objective of profit. So in addition to profit, customer satisfaction, customer wants and needs should be satisfied in order to sustain in the long run. All right. We want also to minimize, if not eliminate, errors, wastes, and delays. So that is to eradicate or minimize customer complaints. I think this is about on the negative ones because complaints also can be learning lessons, especially the comments and suggestions. Then after that, we have to serve the customer, whether we like it or not. They're our clients. We have to be served. Their needs are to be considered or prioritized then there has been some changes already in the landscape but these are unlike the accounting standards we're in changes are really dramatic but in terms of the management accounting like decades for updates so here are some outputs based on the practice of excellent companies so this is the book in search of excellence the authors identified the following principles practiced by excellent companies. So a bias for action, meaning the action is geared towards customer satisfaction, to close to customer, autonomy and entrepreneurship. So independent and being a businessman and on top of a businessman service provider, productivity through people, hands-on value driven, stick to the meeting to whatever process there is simple form lean stuff so like it's simple it's limited it's easier to digest and simultaneous loose tight properties so if you can just notice quality is not built in one day quality cannot happen overnight so it takes time it takes continuous efforts and sustained efforts to be able to get there to the quality that is to be achieved. Now, there are the five S's, which are also like borrowed and learned by us from the Japanese. So we have the five S's, sort, then here are there, okay. We will just skip the Japanese term, sorting out a sort then systematically arrange, sweep, then standardize, and self-discipline, or sorting out systematic arrangements, speak and span or sweep, standardizing, and self-discipline. So these are the five S's that we are thinking and we are talking about in management subjects. So I guess these are terms that even us can really understand also. Sorting is to group them into meaningful patterns or groups. Or let's say we are going to place them into groups also. Systematic arrangement, this is arrangement, yeah. Very related to sorting out. Sweep is really cleaning. Aside from physical, but also inside. We have to sweep also the inside. Standardize is to measure, or standardizing is to measure our outputs based, of course, on certain benchmarks or targets. Self-discipline is about oneself to control in terms of behavior and etc. in the organization. Next, quality cost. If you want quality, pay for it. There is nothing for free. Quality has to be paid. Quality has a price. Then in terms of quality, there are costs to be involved, whether conformance or non-conformance. Conformance means the cost that would involve us to comply with certain aspects or theories or concepts about quality. 
And these are the prevention. Prevention is better than cure. An ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure, as they say. So prevention is important. Then appraisal is to extend further what has been prevented. On the other hand, these are the two costs for conformance. The non-conformance also has two. The failure that is done internally within the business and externally for the failure. So whenever there are failure or failures on our production, for example, or services, then it has to be addressed either inside or outside, but more costly if outside, of course. So the more that we invest on the conformance, the lesser that we spend on the non-conformance. That's the basic concept. And vice versa. Conformance connotes precision. So a precision means an error-free environment. However, whether we like it or not, even with Six Sigma or ISO 9000, there would always be provisions for errors. So if we would like to avoid it or minimize it to the minimum possible level or the possible levels that would be the most minimum or minimal, I would say, then that is to really invest to conformance and to prevent it. As being said also, do it right from the very first time. That's what quality says. All right. But I think do it right from the very first time can also have some compensatory factors on other things. Like if it's really early stage, you really have to invest more time because you are not going to give allowance for errors. All right. Then after that, we have the quality costs or cost of quality. So as said, the examples prevention, these are the costs which are being placed in the respective operations of the business so that we would be able to prevent as much as possible any problems, issues, or concerns later on. Appraisal is to improve the existing and internal is when there are some errors made internally and to be addressed internally. Externally is if it ever already went out of the business and we have to address. Example of that is warranty. So you can go over with this one. Anyway, this is just a review of your cost accounting part one, wherein this has been talked about. But the terms now are conformance and non-conformance. So in other words, bottom line, we listen to what the customer says and make a design based on what they are saying. Because again, customer is the king. Then designing is not the domain of only one person. Yeah, that's true. Everybody should be involved in the process, especially those who are going to, let's say, be part of the operations of the business. The designing should even be coming from marketing, manufacturing, distribution, meaning all the other functional departments connected or related to the company, especially in the provision of goods and services or products. Next, suppliers management would involve talking about and carefully selecting our vendors or suppliers so that we get the quality raw materials or of course these are the products from them because they will be used by us in our operations and whatever issues there will be obtained by us also in our operations. So in suppliers management, we have to be careful about our suppliers. We just not think of just one source, but also many sources. So that in case supplier one cannot give, we have also other suppliers. Then there should be continuous training of our employees. I said, yeah, that's true. Then as much as possible, we have to avoid disruptions to our operations like repairs because that would involve later on, especially if that has been happening for so many times, loss of revenues because we cannot anymore provide the products and produce them on time. So that's why aside from the repairs that would be done, maintenance should be in place. So there should be some parts wherein we have to check the conditions of our existing equipment or machines. So inspection is done to detect conformance, establish process. This is prevention cost. All right. Then 
the locations in which quality costs are incurred would be here. So suppliers and for, I mean, evaluation. Yeah, that's suppliers evaluation. And then coming from the supplier, design engineering. So within the company, it's a company. External failure costs the customers. So meaning, where are the sources of these costs? Okay, so the point here is that these are costs to be spent by the company or business. But what are the sources? Where are the sources? So for this one, supplier's evaluation, the supplier, for these ones, the company itself. For external failure costs, the customers are the sources. All right. Next, quality costs report which show us our conformance cost versus non-conformance cost and the respective components. Then the percentages are shown. Also, we can compare year one and two if ever there has been an increase or decrease or increases and decreases of them. That's the point of this one. All right, the percentage is determined as a percentage of net sales assumed at 40 million. So we can now say that, for example, design engineering is 1.38% of net sales. So meaning we spent cost of this 1.38%. What's the overall? Oh, it's 16.5% of net sales just for the total quality costs, right? So if we invest in... This one, more, let's check. There has been an increase in prevention. Let's check conformance. What happened to non-conformance? From 11.35, yeah, it decreased to 4.30C. So if we invest more on the conformance, then we have lesser non-conformance. All right. And we can see here, the lesson here is that there is an inverse relationship between our conformance and non-conformance. So conformance increases, non-conformance decreases. But our total quality cost, of course, is just this line. But we can notice it's going downward also because it is pulled by the non-conformance that's going downward. Okay. Then other than that, we have the life cycle analysis wherein we think of the phases of the product, the life cycle. So we have known that the life cycle of the product is from introduction, then growth, then maturity and decline. Maturity is saturation also. So those are the costs in producing the products. However, these are the costs which are so-called the traditional costs. And we will know on later on that there are also other costs that we have to think about, which are things that you have known for sure in the past or from your other subjects. So hmm, we are going to look into this one, page 616 though. Okay, so in order for us to be able to produce the product, there are costs that would trigger us prior for such. So what made us obtain the permit or license or the right to produce the product. So there has been some research and development endeavors and design engineering made. So this is like one area that we have to look into. And these are the upward costs. These are now included in life cycle analysis costing. And also the downward. So what costs needed so that our particular products could move to the market? So we need to spend for marketing and distribution. So these are the downward costs. Next, change and managerial lingo. Lingo means language. There has been a lot of changes also in terms of language. We now talk about business process re-engineering. We're in, we go back in time and we are going to reconstruct the process out of a certain product. So process re-engineering or improvement of the process while Kaizen means continuous improvement. All right. You also have process mapping from input to output. We check the activities that there are as we go along the way. So some activities would be process, the processing, move, movement, and then weight and inspection. So these are terms that we can relate. 
process time is really the value added activity because it's changing the raw materials with the use of our conversion costs into finished products, of course. However, the move time, wait time, and inspection time would be the non value added activities because they're just like after the production of the products. Then here's a ratio. So manufacturing cycle efficiency rate is process time over throughput time. So throughput time is the sum of all activities from input to output, which includes the process, weight, move, and inspection. So here's an example. Process is three. If we add everything, so weight, inspection, process, and move. Weight, by the way, is time the order is placed until the goods are delivered and received and start the production to completion. So these are the waiting times. Therefore, the delivery cycle time total really is 20 days, right? So 15 days of throughput time plus the five days suppliers lead time. All right. Okay, let's scrutinize that. The wait time here from the time the order is placed to the date the units are delivered and received. So meaning we're talking here about not the delivery to the customer, but the delivery to us from the supplier. Because we have to wait. How can we proceed with the production? How can we process the products if we don't have the raw material? So the waiting time that we wait for the suppliers to deliver, that's the lead time. Suppliers lead time or waiting time. That's five. The start of production, this is really the beginning. So seven, the completion, that's seven. Seven plus two, 2.5, that's five. That's 12 plus 15, 15 days. So these are the total number of days for a throughput time. Process is three. So three divided by 15 is 20%. And the delivery cycle time then is 20 days overall. So the total of everything. Then process reengineering is a macro approach, meaning overall approach to process improvement. We need to overhaul the process, the paradigm shift, for example, is made because it's possible that what we have done from the past is no longer relevant, is no longer useful. So that's why there has been a mental shift. And we need also to have the paradigm shift. So this can really happen if we listen to our customers instead of assuming what they need unless if the company really is established like apple where in every product that they make the people seem to adjust or the market however that's not always the case especially for companies wherein they are new in the world or in the environment or their products really are not going to dictate immediately the market so there are factors to consider that's why they have to listen to the customers I said rethinking radical, meaning major design improvement in critical contemporary measures such as cost, quality, service, and speed. So dramatic means quantum leaps. So like major movements from one area to another, not just marginal, incremental, or just little by little change. All right, so some of the terms here really are words in which I'm pretty sure everybody can really connect to. So we'll just be selecting the important parts. Now, for business process restructuring issues and implications, these are the issues. Performance man measurement, rather, the key performance measures must be built around processes. So we have to check the process, not the department. And this may affect the design of responsibility center. So we are now more on the process. What is really the process? So that's going to be the basis of our groups or grouping of certain activities later on. Reporting is the values added. So meaning, whenever there is value, that's going to be the basis of report. Activity is going to be based on the management of activity and the costing is activity-based. Structure is going to depend on the complexity of the reporting system and no viruses can be obtained. So depending on standard versus actual, 
then there could be some variances that could happen along the way. Next, Kaizen. Oh, I love this one. Kaizen means continuous improvement. So whatever we do, any action that we do, whether that's little or big, it should add to what we are doing. As the saying goes, a journey to a thousand miles begins with a single step. So every single step counts because they are done in a manner that is thought about or that is analyzed properly. After that is plan, do, check, act, cycle, or PDCA, wherein we plan, we think of the things needed. So we think of the resources to be used, not just the costs or the amount, even humans, the human resources, which are considered to be very important resources for the business. So plan or planning would also involve planning, organizing, and staffing, staffing for people before we implement. So that's leading or directing. Check, of course, is that we are going to do also the controlling aspect as well as act. These are controlling now. So in checking, we are going to do the variance analysis. Then we can determine the feedback or variance. Then we act out of it so that in the next phase, we can improve our planning aspect. So this is the scientific approach known as the Deming wheel. All right, so here are some activities and techniques. So I've already explained it. I would just like to highlight though in two, which is small scale. Check is determine what happened in the small scale and pilot testing. Act is now really the full or the large scale implementation. Next, just in time management would be the philosophy wherein the goods are available just in time that the customers are wanting the products or are ordering the product. So if somebody calls that I need the following, the products are ready already to be delivered. And that's why the challenge here is that the suppliers also should be ready, not just one supplier. And it should be within the same area or locality of your respective place of business. Otherwise, that's going to be challenging. So that's why not all companies can really apply just in time. But this is the demand of the customers that they wanted that we want the product. So the products can be delivered or can be produced immediately. So this has been done with manufacturing of cars industry or car manufacturers. And then really it's dramatic and it's revolutionary. It's there like when customers order the cars, they're really produced it just in time and to be delivered them immediately. So that's how amazing that is to really watch and see just in time management. All right, so suppliers accreditation and retention, we have to continuously evaluate the credibility of our suppliers. I said not just one. The suppliers are our back-end partners. Customers are our front-end customers. The equipment should, or should be most efficient and there should be maintenance program for the machineries. So it should be there. The equipment and machinery should be on their top condition and performance. Otherwise, there would be stoppages, there would be downtimes, repairs, and lost sales. So there can a lot of things that would happen that would affect the production. And that would now affect our philosophy of just-in-time. So that's why I said, bottom line, not everybody applied to this one because it's going to be really very challenging for a company. Resources should be there, available immediately. Could be in the warehouse, which can be pulled out immediately. And when orders are made, done immediately. So just like with the restaurant and etc., they can easily do that. But for big companies that really would involve massive production, then that's going to be challenging. Personnel should be well-trained responsible and quality oriented. So everything that they do dictates quality. They should be 
thinking about quality, quality, and quality to provide the best quality products to their customers. All right, so design departments should be effective and efficient. Then, oh, here's the thing. There should be the usage of statistical quality control techniques. This should be, or these should be employed in the managing under just in time philosophy, linear programming. So you can just imagine the calculations and the graphs, then regression analysis, the equations that are to be made so that they would easily address the potential problem or possible problem. So see, the mathematical models would help us diagnose the problems that there are. So in other words, in just-in-time philosophy, the techniques for quality control are based on statistics or statistical, and they would address those problems that we can encounter. And this is going to be mathematical and very analytical. So again, it's not that easy. It adds to what I said. All right, then plant layout should be improved in such a way that there would be lesser lead time moving from one area to another. If you think of a company, so there would be a major revamp, like if this is process one, process two should be there in the next door perhaps or next area, or there can be some sort of movers or like rollers which are computerized, like manufacture of cans of sardines, wherein the cans would be moving from this area to another and then people would just be observing. Like That's why the reason of why direct labor would be under factory overhead. Since the cost of the direct labor would now be support of the machines. The machines would be filling, for example, the cans. Those sardines that are filled there actually are being cleaned or let's say cleansed rather by the employees but after that everything goes very mechanical technological and computerized so the customers would be experiencing them like just in time but cans of sardines not necessarily I would say that that's just in time, but we can just connect with what happened in the production area. Like, again, the employees will clean or cleanse the fishes or the sardines. And then once they're done, the machines will do the processes later on. The sardines would be placed in cans, putting the sauce and closing the cans and labeling. So everything is done by machines afterwards. And the people will just be looking if some cans are being toppled over or they are not of quality and they should be removed. So something like that. But even machines can do that. Hence a challenge in just in time. So just in time and velocity. Manufacturing this velocity <laughs> refers to the speed with which units or tasks are processed in a system. Okay, so velocity, just like in our physics, would mean how fast in respect to time or the speed in which the tasks or the units are being processed, meaning they are done. So example, if there are 4,000 units in a given process at a given time and the process produces 1,000 units a day, how long will it take a unit to complete? So let's say 4,000 units overall, 1,000 units per day, that's division, that's simple division, that's four days. So in other words, the manufacturing velocity is the number of units in a process divided by the production rate. So to illustrate further, the 4,000 units in process, the 1,000 units a day, if you divide that, that's 40. Okay. Ah, uh, yeah. So, in other words, this is an assumption that there's reduction of the in process by 40%. So, that's the 40% then. It's given. So, before is 
in process for 1,000, but because of the reduction, so the units are changed into 2,400. Okay, so if there has been reduction because of the implementation of the JIT system or philosophy, so instead of having a manufacturing velocity of 4,000 over 1,000, that's four days. So 2,400 2, divided by 1,000 is 2.4 days. So that's the reason that we can notice that there has also been reduction of 40%. So if the reduction is 40%, then the net percentage is 60%. So that's 100% minus 40% is 60%. If we multiply four days by 60%, that's going to result also to 2.4 days. And that's the net or the after manufacturing velocity because of the reduction of the in process with the JIT implementation. So with that, if there has been reduction of the in process inventory, then we can see it cost of carrying inventories in our stock room or warehouse. And that would also increase anyway the ordering costs. So this will be discussed further in inventory management because if there has been reduction of our available inventories in the warehouse, so we need to order more goods so that we can support our JIT system. All right. Increasing the production rate would be one of the concerns of the JIT system. How fast are we? That's the manufacturing velocity. All right, so that's it for now for the part one of the strategic management philosophies. Then stay put or bear with me for another edition or another session for this particular topic or chapter. So in the next part, we will be ending the session. Thank you guys for listening and bye for now. God bless.